Man, you may be seated. How's everyone today? I'd like to get it on the record that uh, I did have like a collared sweater on before this, but that first song, like I really like worked up into a sweat there. I was like, man, it's too hot. Too up, too upbeat song. We got to slow it down a little bit, get more somber, I guess is what we got to do, right? No. No. <laughs> Slow things down a little bit. My name is Brad. I'm the teaching elder here at The Way, and uh, I'm so glad that you are here. If you have your copy of God's Word, we're going to be in Genesis chapter 23 as we continue our study through the book of Genesis entitled Foundations. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, there's one right back there on the table for free. You can have if you need a copy of God's Word. No problem there at all. We're here for you. <coughs> this has been a uh, a amazing couple of weeks for me personally uh, there's been a lot going on in my life a few things uh, granddaughter Friday night Woo-hoo! granddaughter number four uh, came uh, gosh she took her like 18 hours uh, I mean how hard is it you just <laughs> Bailey, I don't know if you're watching or not. So uh, after 18 hours little Cora was born about 2.30 Friday night uh, Saturday morning, my poor wife was there with her the whole time and was honored to be there. She actually finally got a little sleep last night, so that's where she is right now. And uh, But in welcoming a new life into this world, I'm just reminded of the, the wonder of life and how amazing uh, life is. And one of the things I love about our church is uh, we have had, that were still really young, a lot of young families in our church and I've been privileged to see young families start uh, their their families with uh, with their having children here, and it's been amazing to see. Uh, and I and I have been privileged because I've got to preach the very first sermon to a number of little little guys and gals. I'm thinking of little Benji uh, with the Malloy family, uh, Colby, I think, uh, Miss Anna who's still out, and then hopefully I'll be the first one to get to preach the word of God to little Cora. Maybe she's listening even now. Wonders of technology. But uh, as we think about life, uh, today we're going to switch gears and we're going to uh, talk about a very upbeat topic. We're going to talk about death as opposed to life. And everybody's like, hey, we're going to talk about death. Uh, But I think it's important that we talk about death because death is a part of life. And we must understand death correctly and biblically because it, it is a universal issue that we all must deal with. So just as I welcome the new life into our family, uh, just a couple weeks prior to that, you know, I lost my father, and I was privileged to spend the last couple of hours of his life with him. So within a span of a couple of weeks, I got to see death and then the newness of life, and it's just been a been a good journey for me, spiritually speaking. Eight thousand people a day die in the United States every single day. There's roughly eight thousand uh, people that die every single day from numerous causes. Of course, with coronavirus, that has everybody on edge and, you know, it gives a new uh, kind of lens into death. Uh, People are more focused on that. It seems like a lot of people are really afraid. Uh, On average, 900 people uh, have died since it all began uh, of coronavirus. We're currently on the down end of people dying, although there's a little bit of an upswing currently of cases. I don't know if we're getting better treating it or not. Uh, but if, interestingly enough, the number of deaths total in America has remained about the same. It's been about 8,000 for several years. About 300 people a day die of uh, the common flu. The most common cause of death in the United States is heart disease. Every single year, over 650,000 people die from heart disease. Uh, and the two leading factors that cause heart disease are inactivity and obesity. Uh, something that are both within our own control. Uh, interesting, that, that would preach right there. Uh, the second leading cause of death in America is cancer. Over 600,000 people a year die from cancer. Uh, of course, currently in the middle of the pandemic, we're it was shade over 200,000 people died from uh, coronavirus. 170,000 people die every year from accidents. Just accidents, random accidents. This was an interesting stat. I wonder whether or not. I've brief this one or not, but on the worldwide stage, every single year, 5,000 people die from diarrhea. Who would have thought? I mean, that's a, I mean, that, I, don't, I don't know whether to laugh or cry at that. That's a, uh... 
These are just statistics. These are just statistics. These are just numbers on a page until you personalize it. So somebody that you know, somebody that you love has passed away. You know, when you're young, we're also blessed with a very young congregation. I think I think Cleaver's the oldest dude. The patriarch, maybe Rudy, might have you on a year or two. I'm in the neighborhood, uh, Mr. Ron. <laughs> I don't know where you're at, uh, but we got a pretty young congregation. You know, compared to other churches. But you know, when you're young, you're immortal. You know, look at some of our young guys. You guys are invincible. You guys don't. Uh, give death a second thought. I know when I was that age, when I was a young guy, I didn't think for a second about dying. And then at some point, you are confronted with your own mortality. At some point, you are confronted with the reality that at some point, you will draw your very last breath, and then you will never draw another. And they will put you in the grave. And the second they put you in the grave and cover you up with dirt, the stunning reality is that the world will begin the process of forgetting all about you. That's stunning to think about, isn't it? You don't believe me? Who was the most popular man in Clarksville 40 years ago? You don't have any idea who that man is. He's dead and gone, buried, forgotten about. But he was one time the most popular man in Clarksville. Let's talk about death today as we also reflect upon life in Genesis chapter 23. Let's get into the word as we formulate a theology of death today. And from that, we could possibly craft a philosophy or a theology of life. We're going to talk about Sarah today. We've been talking about the patriarchs, Abraham and Sarah. Today, we're going to zero in on Sarah from Genesis chapter 23. Word of God says in Genesis chapter 23, verse 1. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And Sarah died at Kiriath Arba, that is Hebron, in the land of Canaan. And Abram, Abraham went in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for Sarah. Sarah lived 127 years. These were the years appointed to Sarah. And as we think about our philosophy or theology of life in light of our theology of death, one of the main questions that people ask about life is, to what end? For what reason? To what purpose do I exist? I love the Westminster Shorter Catechism, which says, what is the chief end of man? DJ, what is the chief end of man? Don't let me down, man. You got this. He's on the spot. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. Him and we've been learning that for a while. To glorify God and enjoy him forever. When we look at Sarah's life, we see a life that glorified God when we saw the life that she lived. You recall that she was 65 years old when her husband came to her and said, baby, the Lord told me last night, we've got to go. And she said to him, of course, my love, where would we go? And she, he said, well, I don't know. To a land he will show us. Can you imagine if your spouse came to you and said, we got to go, where are we going? I don't know, we'll know when we get there. The Lord will tell us. But she went, and it happened a second time. Abraham came to her and said, baby, we got to go. Where are we going, my love? I don't know, we'll know when we get there. And we're going to have a child, the Lord has told me. And this child will be a child of promise. She said, I'm 65 years old, we better get busy. If we're going to have a child, they arrive in Canaan. Things are hard in Canaan. There's a famine in the land. It's not always easy following God. It's not always a bed of roses when we follow in the will of God. And so they arrive in Canaan and there's a famine in the land. And so Abraham takes his family and they flee to Egypt. And then in Egypt, we see this is where Abraham committed this great betrayal against Sarah and betrayed her into the arms of another man, the Pharaoh. Of course, the Lord supernaturally intervened, protected them, restored her to him, restored them to him, and then they returned. She held down the fort while Abraham went on a dramatic rescue mission, rescuing Lot from the pagan kings. And then we saw the destruction. She stood by as, as there was the destruction at Sodom and Gomorrah, and her nephew Lot, she has no idea where he ended up, him and his family. After the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, we saw that Abraham took them to the land of the Philistines, and once again, yet again, he betrays her into the arms of another man, this time the wicked king Abimelech. She had to have thought, I can't believe this is happening yet again. Of course, we know that nobody ever falls into the same 
sin patterns that they have previously, right? That only happens in Scripture. The Lord supernaturally protects them yet again. The Lord supernaturally restores them yet again. At some point after 10 years, she does what many women begin to do. She doubts herself. Perhaps I am the problem. Perhaps I am the reason we're not having a child. And so she takes her, her servant Hagar, the young gal, and gives her to Abraham to conceive a child. And she does. He does. And she conceives a child and then she comes and she looks on contempt with Sarah. She says, I can have a child and you can't. That was a status symbol for women in those days. And so Sarah treats her with contempt and she flees, but the Lord restores her. You can see the ups and downs of Sarah's life. You can see the highs and the lows. You can see that things were not all a bed of roses. That these are real people with real struggles, with real issues. Yet she lived a life that glorified God. Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 51, verse 1, he says, Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. If you are a follower of Jesus, Abraham is your spiritual father, just as Sarah is your spiritual mother. Listen to what Peter says about Sarah. He says, this is how the holy women who hoped in God and used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. I've been trying to get Amy to call me Lord for years now. I'm like, it's in the Bible right here. Could y'all help me out with that? <laughs> the Lord. <laughs> Sarah obeyed Abraham. Said, you are our children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. She was lived a life worthy of the Lord. She walked worthy of the call that had been placed upon her. Hebrews 11 says, by faith, Sarah received power to conceive even when she was past the age. Why? Since she considered him faithful who had promised. She considered God faithful. She heard the promises of God and she believed God and she lived a life pleasing to the Lord. She brought glory to God in her life. And we see in her 127 years the sovereign hand of God over every single day of her life. Every single day of her life had been etched in the tablets of God from before time, before time had began. 127 years she was allotted. How many days will you be allotted? We don't yet know. But as you approach the end of your life, how would you like your life to look? How would you like people to look back and reflect upon your life as a life that brought glory to God? Sarah lived 127 years. Verse 2, Sarah died. Sarah died. I'd like to talk to you about death for just a few minutes. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 has a verse that we're going to be in and out of for the next couple minutes. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, the word says, Just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment. As we think about the life of Sarah and the death of Sarah, I want to make a couple of, a couple of notes about death, a couple of observations. The first thing I want us to notice is the inevitability of death. The inevitability of death. It says just as it was appointed a man, it was decided, it was determined. The days of our lives are numbered just as the hour when we will be called before the Lord is also set from before the foundations of time. I love how Solomon puts it in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. He likens our march to the grave as a house that is steadily falling apart. If you think of a, of a house that's like sitting in the woods by itself with nobody keeping it up, it's just gradually deteriorating over time. And Solomon says, remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. We've got to draw near to our creator now before the house starts to crumble, before the silver cord is snapped, before the golden bowl is broken, the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. We've got to remember our creator in the days of our youth. And why? The psalmist says in Psalm 90, verse 10, the years of our life are 70. 
or even by reason of strength 80. 78.6 to be exact is the average age of an American today. The psalmist confirms that. The years of our life are 70 by reason of strength 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are gone soon and we fly away. And just as our days are numbered, the hour when we will stand before the Lord has been set by the Lord. Job knew this. Job chapter 14, he says, Our days are determined. The number of our months are with you, O Lord, and you have appointed our limits that we cannot pass. I love Psalm 139. I'm giving you a lot of scripture today. I hope that's okay. Psalm 139 might be one of my favorite psalms. David says to the Lord, he says, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. Every one of what? The days that were formed for me. When as yet there was none of them. Our days are written in the book of the Lord before the foundations of the time of time. This is why Paul can say in Ephesians chapter 5, he tells us to pay attention how you walk. In other words, walk carefully, walk deliberately, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Why are the days evil? The days are evil because tomorrow you're going to wake up and you're going to be 50. You're going to be 60. You're going to be 70. And you're going to look back and you're going to wonder, where did my life go? Where did my life go? It is but a vapor. And the moment they put you in the grave, once again, the world will begin the process of forgetting all about you. And there is no man on his deathbed who says, you know, I wish I'd have spent more time watching TV. I wish I'd have spent more time at the office accumulating wealth. I wish I'd have spent more time pursuing possessions. No man says that. The days are evil. And everybody knows it. Consider the lengths that people go to today to avoid death. Considering the lengths that people go to today to prolong our youth and vitality to put off death. Consider the medical industry today. Our medical industry is an industry. It is a for-profit industry. If you don't realize that, again, a lot of amazing things can, can be done through modern medicine. I'm not, I'm not discounting modern medicine, but consider the lengths that modern medicine will go to squeeze just a few more days out of life. To squeeze just a few more hours, a few more minutes out of life. If I can just put off death a little bit longer out of fear. And there's so many people that die with no dignity today. I think of my uncle. I have an uncle. or had an uncle. He was a great man. He stormed the beach at Normandy, my uncle did. He was literally on one of the landing craft at Normandy. Uh, I think it was about a third of his platoon actually lived. He was in his 80s, and they did a, a chest scan. They said, you've got a spot on your lungs that we don't know what it is. And so they took this man in and did exploratory surgery in his 80s to see what the spot on his lungs would be. It turned out that the spot on his lungs was absolutely nothing, but while he was in the hospital, he contracted an infection, and he never left. Died a couple of weeks later in the hospital. Consider the fear of death that we would take people and not allow them to die with any sort of dignity just so we can milk a few more hours, days, or weeks even out of life. Consider the health and wellness industry. You know, if you just eat the right foods, just eat, eat paleo, eat, eat keto, eat the whole 50 or whatever, if you just eat clean, if you just eat the right foods, you can just put off death inevitably or, or as long as you can. If you just take these supplements, take these vitamins, take this vitamins, take this powder over here. There's some superfoods out there. I read about a man that went to the, the Amazon jungle to find a superfood that he could give to us that we could prolong our lives. And listen, don't hear me say that we shouldn't take care of the temple of God. We should take care of the temple of God, but consider the lengths that people go just to try to prolong our youth and our vitality and to put off death as long as physically possible. But we can't, we can't keep up the illusion for too long. At some point, it becomes apparent to us that we're kidding ourselves. And so if we cannot prolong our youth, we seek to prolong at least the illusion of our youth. And so we have all this, the health and beauty Industry whereby we got different creams we can spare on ourselves or different things. If we can just preserve even the appearance of youth 
for just a little while. So fearful of death we are. So fearful we are even of growing old. The inevitability of death. Every single person will be confronted with death at some point in time. The only thing that may perhaps spare us will be if the Lord Jesus were to come in our lifetime. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. There's been two men in history recorded that did not have to die. Enoch and Elijah. Both of them were taken up to the Lord in a supernatural way, unlike the rest of us. So as we look at the death of Sarah, she was allocated 127 years, and then she died. The inevitability of death for all of us. It reminds me of what is the origin of death. Why is death such an issue? Why do we even have death? It didn't even used to be like this. Genesis chapter 1, 31 God says he created everything in six days and he looked at everything that he created and it was very good. It was very good. There was no death. But then we look now and we see in Romans chapter 8, Paul says that the creation is subject to futility. The creation is in bondage to corruption. All of creation is groaning together in the pains of childbirth. Why is creation subject to futility? Because of the fall. Romans chapter 5, Paul says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. We see this happen in the garden when Adam, as our federal head, fell into sin. Genesis chapter 2, God says to Adam, He put him in the garden to work it. He says, Here's the tree of the garden of good and evil. Of the knowledge of good and evil. You shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it. You shall surely die. He said you have everything. God looked at, Adam, looked at Adam and said. I am giving you everything. Including myself. But that wasn't enough for him. And so the serpent deceived the woman. Brought her some fruit from the tree. And he said did God really say. You will not surely die. So the woman looked at the fruit. Saw that it was good to look at. She took some of it. She gave some to her husband and they both partook of it. And instantly they knew that they were naked and they sewed fake leaves together and made themselves loincloths. The fall was complete. Of course, God comes to them. God comes to them and he pronounces a curse upon them. Listen to what he says to the man. Because of their sin, he says, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. Consider what God just told the man. He said, you're going to work until you die. Before that, labor was a holy occupation. Now, he says, you are going to work by the sweat of your brow until you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And then God says, man has become like one of us, eating of the fruit of the tree of good and evil. Now we don't want him to eat from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So he drives the man and the woman from the garden and he places a flaming sword in a cherubim to guard the way to the garden. Genesis chapter 4, immediately following the fall, we have the very first account of the impact and the ramifications of the fall of sin and its death. The very first sin recorded, committed after the fall is violence. That results in the death of Abel as Cain rises up and slays his brother. And we see the manifestations of the fall proceed throughout Scripture as lifespans become shorter and shorter and shorter. 78.6 years as the creation deteriorates. It's in bondage to corruption. This is verified by the second law of thermodynamics, by the way, that tells us that all of creation is in the process of falling apart as the second law of thermodynamics verifies. What is the issue with death, though? If it was just physical death, that wouldn't be a problem. If it was just that we died, that wouldn't be as much of an issue. It would still be an issue for us, but what is the real issue with death? Well, Paul makes that clear in Romans chapter 5. Here is the issue with death. Paul makes a distinction. He lashes up physical death with condemnation. Listen, my wife has worked in the medical industry for many years as a nurse, and she's always worked in nursing homes. She has a special affinity for old people. Old people just love her. Uh, they absolutely love her, and she loves old people too. And I think it takes a special gift uh, to do the type of work that she does. 
my, my older daughter, oldest daughter has that same kind of gift and, and interestingly does the same kind of work. But she's been around hundreds and hundreds of people as they die. And she says there's basically two ways that people go when they die. The first way they go is they go fighting every step of the way, fearful, crying, in and out of consciousness as they march to the grave. That's one way that people go. The other way is they go more peacefully, calling out to people that aren't there, that had died before them. She says there's basically two ways that people go. What are the people seeing that go in a certain way? This is the uncomfortable aspect when we consider what death could possibly mean. We see in Romans chapter 5 that Paul makes a distinction. He lashes up death with condemnation. Listen, it is the deterioration of creation that has caused us to die, that causes our bodies to break down and eventually cease to work. When my father died, they don't actually know exactly why he died. His body just broke down. He was 87 years old, and it was just a multitude of reasons his body had just stopped working. But here Paul tells us that we got a bigger issue than physical death, and the issue is condemnation. He says that judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men. The issue is not that we physically die. The issue is that we are spiritually dead. Ever since the fall, ever since Adam, as our federal head, committed the very first sin. You've heard of the phrase original sin. I don't like the phrase original sin because people get confused and think that refers to the first sin committed. A better phrase is original guilt. Ever since our federal head, Adam, sinned on our behalf, every single man, woman, and child ever born has been born guilty of sin, conceived in sin. Then once you are born, eventually your actions deteriorate into sin. We're born spiritually dead. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 and 3 verifies that when Paul says to the church in Ephesus, he says, but you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You were dead. You weren't sick with sin. You were dead in your sin. Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. And you were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. It is appointed a man to die once and then comes the judgment. Listen, I want to talk for just a minute about an unsettling topic. And this isn't something that I can just wake up and say, hey, I can't wait to go talk about hell. But we got to talk about this as we talk about our theology of death. There are essentially four views of hell within Christendom. Four views. The traditional Orthodox Christian view is that hell is, at a, place, is a place of eternal conscious torment. And they take the scriptures that talk about the fire and the suffering and they say that's literal. That literally hell will be a place of eternal conscious torment. And there will be fire and suffering in that way. There's another spinoff of that view. It's a, a little less literal. But that hell is a place of eternal conscious torment. But that the fire and stuff is, is figurative. It symbolizes suffering. It may not be actual fire and things of that nature, but it's going to be miserable. It's going to be suffering. There's another view that's gained popularity in recent years, decades, called annihilationism. And that is that once souls perish, uh, they may suffer for a time, but at some point God just annihilates them. They cease to exist from that point on. That is a fairly recent view. I uh, hesitate to mention, but I will anyway. There's the view of Purgatory. Uh, if you have any kind of Catholic background or something like that, you've heard of purgatory. And that is a place where people go to pay a bit of suffering for a period of time, depending upon the weight of their sins in this world, before they are released into heaven. It's interesting. I read a book a few years ago uh, about these four different views where four different scholars defended their views. And they had a Catholic priest that defended the view of purgatory. I forget in the opening paragraphs, he's like, he said, you know, there's not much support for Scripture in this view, but anyway, I'll just stop right there. I don't need to hear any more. Uh, they get support from Scripture from the apocryphal books uh, is where the Catholic Church finds support for the doctrine of purgatory. But the traditional view is eternal conscious torment. The issue is 
Proverbs 24, 11 tells us that people are stumbling to the slaughter. People are marching to the death every single day. If you look around and you see people, they're not just walking around living their lives. They are literally stumbling unto condemnation. The issue with death is not that it's a period, that death is a comma. It's Sarah died and then there's something else after and it will be the same for each and every single one of us. There's a comma after the word died. So and so died, comma, and then something. And what we see from scripture is that the default setting for everyone is condemnation. And you say, well, what about Jesus? What about friendly Jesus? You know, Jesus with the lamb and the children. Well, Jesus himself tells us in Matthew chapter 25, he says about the condemned that he will say to them, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And he says, go away from me into eternal punishment. These are the words of Jesus. So what happens when we die? What happens the moment we close our eyes in this world and open them in eternity? What scripture tells us, the orthodox view is that there is an intermediate state. Again, you won't find the word hell anywhere in scripture. There are essentially four words in scripture that refer to the afterlife for the condemned. In the Old Testament, it was Sheol. And Sheol was kind of like a shadowy world of, of the dead. It was kind of a shadowy world where the dead went. But then when in, the, in the New Testament, we see three different words for the afterlife for the condemned. We see the word Tartarus. Tartarus is the place often called hell, whereby God puts the angels that sinned in Genesis chapter 6 to keep them until the judgment. And then we see Hades. If you look in Luke chapter 16, there's a great account of the rich man and Lazarus told by Jesus again. And this is where we get much of our doctrine of the intermediate state of Hades for the condemned. The rich man in this parable, he, he dies condemned and he goes to Hades. He's buried and he goes to Hades. Well, what happens in Hades? He's tormented in Hades. He's suffering in Hades. He can see and he knows that he is not where he should be. He can see and he knows that he's not where he wants to be. And there's a great chasm fixed between him. He can't cross the chasm. It is appointed a man to die once. There are no second chances. No second chances. And the rich man in this account is confronted with this fact as he's suffering in Hades Again, sometimes that is translated hell. But then what scripture tells us is at some point in time, Jesus is going to return. Jesus is going to come again in power and authority. And there's going to be a couple of things happen when the Lord returns. One is there's going to be a resurrection. And every single person that has ever lived will stand before the Lord. And they're going to open the books, the book of life. They're going to look, open the book of life and the dead are going to be judged by what is written in the books according to what they have done. And then it says that death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. This is what Jesus uses when he uses the word Gehenna, which is translated hell. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, he's thrown into the lake of fire. This is the fate of those who die in their sin. So and so died, comma, and then they will one day die a second death in the lake of fire where they will suffer for eternity. This is the default setting of every single person that has ever lived. Had God never done anything. Listen, there is a fundamental truth. And again, this is the, this is the hard news of Scripture. But there is a fundamental truth that we've got to come to terms with, that we've got to believe. And that is this that God would be absolutely and would have been absolutely justified, absolutely just, had he allowed every single person to ever live, who have ever lived, to march their way right into hell. That's a tough truth when you think about what that actually means, especially when you apply that to yourself. That God would still have been who he is. God would still be great as he is. God would still be holy as he is. God would still be exactly who he is had he allowed every single person to perish in their sins and suffer for an eternity in hell. I hope I never have to preach the sermon of an unsafe person or the funeral of an unsafe person. I've spoken at a couple funerals, my father's for starters, and I would just so I could proclaim the gospel. 
But outside of that, I don't know what I would possibly say at the funeral of a lost person. Listen, when we think about the reality of what death could possibly mean, if that doesn't do something to you, if that isn't unsettling to you, if that is, doesn't make you uncomfortable in some way, when you consider the sheer horror that somebody might close their eyes in this world and open them to something such as that. Especially when you consider the scripture tells us there are many who will close their eyes in this world with an expectation that will be shockingly revealed to them as they open their eyes into the afterlife. This is the real issue with death. This is the issue. Not that we physically die, but that we are spiritually dead already. But God. But God. Being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he once loved us or with which he does love us. Even when we were dead in our sins, made us alive together in Christ. But God, my favorite phrase in all of the Bible, because the amazing thing is that as death brings condemnation for some, death brings deliverance for many. Death brings deliverance. Romans chapter 8, verse 1, Paul says, this is my favorite verse in all of the Bible, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation now or ever, ever. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If somebody can just get behind that verse right there, listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1, that he has caused us to be born again to a living hope, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Kept in heaven for you. And by this we rejoice. Though now for a little while we've, we've been grieved by various trials. We've been tested by the genuineness of our faith. That we may, we may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. What an amazing truth this is. Listen, when we look to the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, we also see an intermediate state for the believer. And it's called heaven. It's called paradise. Jesus looked at the thief on the cross and said, today you will be with me in paradise. And we see Lazarus is there with Abraham in paradise and he's being comforted. But in just the same way that the resurrection affects those who are condemned, those who die in Christ, also one day there's going to be the resurrection at the coming of Christ. And they're going to stand before the Lord and they are going to receive all of the inheritance that was set for them. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 when that happens. This is one of the most glorious truths in all of Scripture. At the resurrection for the righteous, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then will come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is law is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What an amazing thing that God could take something grievous like death and turn it into victory. When we look at death, we have victory. And you say, well, my life is hard right now. Well, listen to what Paul says. This light and momentary affliction is preparing us. For an eternal weight of glory that is yet to be revealed. That is beyond comparison. Listen to what he says to the Romans in Romans chapter 8. When he talks about our suffering in this present light. He says, I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing the glory that is to be revealed to us. When we think about the victory that we have in death, I pray that we could have the same attitude that Paul has in Philippians chapter 1. Listen to what he says in Philippians chapter 1. He says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I live or die, it doesn't matter to me because if I live, it's not me living anyway. It's Christ living in me. But if I die, even if I die, it is gain. He says, I'm hard pressed. Between the two, my desire is to depart. Paul said, I want to die. 
I want to go be with my Lord Jesus. I want that victory. But he says, not yet. It's necessary that I remain here on your account. God gives us victory in death. Listen, one day we're going to close our eyes. If you're a child of God, you're going to close your eyes in this life and open them unto glory. And you're going to hear the most beautiful words you've ever heard in your life. Well done, good and faithful servant. I can't wait to hear those words. And there's not going to be any more tears. There's not going to be any more sorrow, any more darkness, ungodliness. No more sin, no more curse of sin. And no more death and pain. And you know who's going to be there? The saints are going to be there. It's going to be a, a river of the water of life. There's going to be healing fruit. Jesus is going to be there, the Lamb of God. And we're going to worship Him. There's going to be a feast. There's going to be a wedding feast. It's going to be so amazing. And we are going to see the unveiled face of God. It's been veiled until now, but we are going to see the unveiled face of God. That will be the comma that comes after our name. And so and so died. Sarah's going to be there. Abraham, too. Did you know that? Isaac will be there. Jacob's going to be there. Moses. Abel's going to be there. Noah's going to be there. Maybe Nicodemus. I don't know. Mary, Lydia, David, Samson, Samuel. They're going to be there. Paul's waiting on us to get there. Apollos, Priscilla, and Aquila. They're all going to be there. This is the theology of death for those who are in Christ Jesus. So I could ask you a couple more questions. I'm going to ask you a couple, but the primary question I'll ask you today is, are you in the Lord Jesus? Some of you I know, some of you I don't. For those of us in, in, in Jesus, in Christ, God has given us the victory in death. Have you been given that victory? Have you repented of your sins and been saved? Or are you going through the motions? For those of us that are of the Lord, we can live in this glorious truth that God has taken death and given us victory in death. That God would do such a thing. And that would cause us to live in a couple of ways as we examine the ways that we live. Based upon the death that we know, the victory that we know is going to come in death. That we would live today. Did you know that the only thing that you own, the only thing that belongs to you is the very breath of your lungs right now. That's it. You don't know if you'll have another. You have no idea. So we've got to live today. We can't live under the tyranny of tomorrow and the yoke of yesterday. God has put you exactly where you are for such a time as this. And we would live today and we pray for God to give us today our daily bread. To give us exactly what we need to live today for the work that he has called us to live today. To do today. That we would live courageously and boldly. That we would take up our cross every single day. That means that I'm willing to live unto death. And have the same attitude as Paul. That we would live courageously and boldly. That we would live righteously. I don't know when the Lord is going to call me home. But I want to be in fellowship with him when I go. I want to go down praising. I don't know about you. I want to go down worshiping him. I don't know how you want to go. But that's how I want to go. I want to live righteously. I want to live hopefully. I don't live fearfully. I live hopefully. I live gratefully. I can't believe he's allowed me to live this long. I live gratefully. I cherish every single moment. I cherish every breath. I cherish every person in my life. All the things that God has blessed me with. And I live urgently. Urgently. Because there are thousands of people around me every single day who do not know this magnificent truth. And are still stumbling through the slaughter. That I could go to them and say, brother, you don't have to be afraid anymore. Let me tell you about the Lord. So Abraham he goes in to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. It's okay to mourn and to weep in death. Just the other day I had a moment where I was thought about my father. I laid there and I mourned. I wept in the arms of my wife. It's okay to mourn and to weep death. Abraham does. He was a man of faith. But we don't mourn as those who have no hope. 
That's what 1 Thessalonians 4.13. We mourn as those who have hope. Makes me think about death. That form the way we live. Do you know that hope today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. We praise you, Jesus. God, I'm praising you today for this word that penetrates to our hearts like a two-edged sword, dividing soul from spirit and bone from marrow. I'm praising you right now that even now you are working on the hearts of your people. 